Neri Zibler joins us. He is a fellow over at the Washington Institute. Uh, good to have you on the show. Um, so we know that this is all about um, the coalition failing uh, to pass a budget. But take us behind the scenes. What, what's really at play here? Well, the budget was just an excuse. Uh, it was just uh, the trigger. But the real strategic issue underlying now a fourth election in two years is Netanyahu's uh, unwillingness to relinquish uh, the prime minister post, as agreed to uh, earlier this year when he formed this national unity government with uh, his now defense minister, Benny Gantz, uh, as well as Netanyahu's uh, uh, determination uh, to at least try for a parliamentary majority in order to quash and halt uh, the legal proceedings against him. So okay. Netanyahu had no intention earlier this year of upholding the agreement he signed, and the budget was really the only out he had uh, to topple his own government. Okay, um, I get that. So uh, Netanyahu is basically saying that, you know, if an election is forced upon us, then I promise you that we will win. Meanwhile, Benny Gantz, um, you know, looking at the opinion polls, his standing doesn't look all that great. I mean, who has the advantage for now? Well, Benny Gantz uh, is more than likely on his way out of political life. Uh, his voter base, his center-left voter base, will likely not uh, forgive him for... Uh, going back on his core election promise, which was to not sit in government with Netanyahu. So Gantz and Blunwhite are likely done. Uh, Netanyahu is now facing a challenge from the right. Uh, he has defections from within his own Likud party, and that will, or at least has the potential of uh, sniping votes away from Likud. Uh, but again, the center and center-left opposition is, as you mentioned, in disarray. So uh, we don't quite know what will happen, but really Netanyahu, the main question for Netanyahu is whether he can reach a parliamentary majority uh, with his, you know, right-wing allies. That's the real question uh, heading into the March election. Okay, so, Neda, you, you talked about defections from his own Likud party. I mean, come March, uh, the fact of the matter is that Donald Trump, who uh, he shares a very close relationship, will no longer be in office. How does this play into things? Uh, it'll have a, a major impact, I believe. Uh, we've seen now over the past three election campaigns that Trump uh, took an active hand uh, in internal Israeli politics, uh, in crucial moments, he provided Netanyahu with major diplomatic gifts, uh, recognition of, of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, uh, the quote-unquote peace deal of the century uh, with regard to the Palestinians, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, with Trump out of the way, uh, Biden will likely take a very different approach. And so Netanyahu's natural ally, really the, uh, the 13th man uh, in terms of Israeli politics, uh, will not be there. And so he'll, he's going to have to navigate that very delicately in terms of, his, of Netanyahu's own uh, public position as, uh, you know, the diplomatic leader for Israel, a statesman on the global stage. Let's talk about the Israelis, Israeli people. I mean, what do they think in all this? I mean, four elections in two years, that's, that's an awful lot. Uh, it is. Uh, Israel holds the dubious mark now of being the, uh, the country uh, that goes to elections the most, uh, on average, every just over two years, uh, the first place in the world a very dubious honor. Uh, Israelis are uh, quite angry and set up with this political class, uh, but we haven't seen that necessarily translate to plummeting support for Netanyahu. Uh, as we know, he has a very loyal and very cohesive base of support amongst the Israeli right. Uh, you know, people like Gidon Sar, the people that are defecting now from the Likud, will try to eat into that very base. And that's going to be a key question uh, in the election campaign. All right. There is always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us.